I didn't know I needed a camera. Yeah. That so we got half there. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Kenny, yeah. Kenny, Kenny makes me do the uh, the video too, and uh, you know, I'm just you know I'm I'm fortunate. I'm actually wearing clothes right now, so. <laughs> but we don't know if you're wearing pants. This is true. This is episode 190 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and you probably saw this week that a label was approved by the TTB for a new E.H. Taylor release. It uses amaranth as one of its grain sources, and the label calls it the grain of the gods. The news was first broken by Blake over at bourboner.com, so you can go there and read more about it, but also check out bourbonweekly.com for the satire piece, because they put that Buffalo Trace has now rewritten the history books on Colonel E.H. Taylor because they found a goof on the label. It now depicts him as a 300-year-old man from the 1600s. Now tomorrow, March 1st, I want to see you at Down One Bourbon Bar here in Louisville, Kentucky between 4 and 6 p.m. We're going to be doing our first live recording and live streaming of the podcast as we're joined by Chris Morris and Elizabeth McCall of Woodford Reserve. And if you can't be there, as I mentioned, it's live stream, so you can be there remotely via Facebook and YouTube. We do have four barrel selections that are available for purchase to the general public. We have our Maker's 46 private selection, which tastes like a boozy French toast. We also have a 1792 foolproof. It's called Case of the Mondays. And we have two whistle pig barrels and they are 13 year old rise. One I really love because it kind of reminds me and reminiscent of a Booker's rye. The links to purchase these are going to be available on our Facebook page, so make sure you go there and check it out. If you're a Patreon supporter and you're just now hearing about it, hurry up before this actually does get posted later this Thursday night. We love hearing the perspective from the retail side of the show, knowing what sort of bourbon craziness goes on because of their customers during a release season, or maybe they just feel the pressure from the three-tier system. This one sort of takes a different angle because Jamie Ferris of Lincoln Road is really notable for his store picks. Sometimes he even has over 70 available at one time in his store in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. If you're interested to know more about Bourbon Pursuit and what we're going to be doing, like us on Facebook and check out our event calendar for all future planned extravagant releases and cool things we're going to be doing. Now, let's hear from our good friend Joe at Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, this is Joe Beatrice from Barrel Bourbon. We blend cast rank, high quality spirits to explore the effects of different distillation methods, barrels, and aging environments. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. At this exact moment, I'm looking at a framed newspaper article on my wall. It says, Whiskey and Writers Stirred. It was a piece done in the New York Times a couple years ago. It featured myself, Heather Green, Noah Rothbaum, Lou Bryson, Clay Risen, and many more. And it talked about the growth and the enthusiasm behind whiskey writing. I remember when that story came out, I felt so honored that I was included. But more than anything, I had this incredible feeling that whiskey writing was going to take it to the next level, that we were about to become as mainstream as wine and people would be as interested in us as food. But then something happened. Brands started realizing that they couldn't grow if they only focused on the people who were currently buying their product. And so there was a lot less effort to grow whiskey media. And instead... The whiskey media changed from a hardcore kind of production and science piece to more of a lifestyle driven and like 50 bourbons under $50. And then you started seeing scores of so called influencer entering the whiskey space. And that's all the brands would chase. And in whiskey, all you have to do is follow the money. Today in Kentucky and Scotland and wherever whiskey is made, if there is a marketing dollar, they're getting on Instagram and they're seeing who's important and who's not. 
Are they choosing to fly out an Instagram influencer to learn about the whiskey processes or a whiskey writer? Hey, more times than not, they're choosing the Instagram influencer. And why that bothers me is because we're not pursuing knowledge in a space that really should be rewarding knowledge. Instead, we're rewarding people who have more likes or more have more followers or they look good when they stare one way or they have a handbag over their shoulder. You can be good looking and an influencer and, and have the knowledge. So I hope that if you are an influencer, if you're someone who's trying to break into this world of whiskey, I hope you do it the right way, like Jackie James has, an Instagram influencer who flew down to Kentucky to take the Staven Thief program and to go to the distilleries. She didn't do it for money. She did it out of passion. I have a great fear of where whiskey media is going. If there is more and more money pumped into capture the influencers who don't really have a passion, who don't really care about American whiskey, then we'll see eventually everything just boil right down to marketing. And I don't want that. So do me a favor. Go read Carla Carlton's book. Go read Mike Veach's book, Chuck Cowdery's blog or book. Pick up one of mine. Go to a library. Read through old texts of Whiskey Magazine, Whiskey Advocate, and Bourbon Plus, my magazine. Read, read, read. Talk and inform one another. We cannot have an illiterate base of whiskey consumers. So let us not let the new wave of influencers influence us. Let's change the game. Let's get smart. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, you know, I got a YouTube channel. Go check it out. Search Fred Minnick at YouTube. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Fred here talking about store picks and about retail stores. And this is one with a guest that we have not had on the show before. However, anybody that has been around bourbon for quite some time is probably aware of his store. And Fred, you were we were kind of talking a little bit before we hit this record button here that you had actually done a review of one of his store picks uh, at some point in the, the past as well. Yeah. So uh, when I was uh, a reviewer for uh, Whiskey Advocate, I – was clued in on this uh, this store in Mississippi called uh, Lincoln Road Package Store. Yeah, you know, that was really getting a lot of steam, and uh, and people were going out of their way to to buy these picks. So I was like, you know, I got to see what this guy's all about. And I, I reviewed uh, several of his uh, picks, and this was really at a time when. You know, when a lot of people didn't know about store picks, so I'd say, you know, three to five years ago, and it and it, I was amazed by them. They were fantastic. They were easily, you know, like a top five, you know, some bourbon in my glass for that year. I mean, they were phenomenal. And then, you know, I would taste them a year later and a year later, and they continue to have that incredible complexity. So he has like this this uh gift or he's bribing people at distilleries or something but he's got he's bottling a lot of good uh good bourbon with his name on it and the good thing is that we talk about this a lot people that get caught up in the chase of limited releases and stuff like that we we keep telling them all the time like just stop just just don't go for it because if you can find people like our guests or you have the opportunity to know a, a liquor store owner and you can you can actually help or sway these um, barrel picks or you know the liquor store owner and they, you know their pal and they have good barrel picks. That's really the, the best place to find some of the greatest whiskey on the market today. Yeah, it's it, it's also a little tapped at the moment. You know, you have uh, brands like Four Roses. Four Roses, you know, five, six years ago when you did a barrel pick there, you would get to taste, you know, 10 barrels And if you didn't like one of those 10, you know, they would roll in some more, Um, you know, Heaven Hill used to just bust out, you know, 12, 14 year old juice like it was nothing. And and so now you have to, 
the, the store owners have to work a little harder to get good barrels, you know, from some of these more, you know, traditional distillers, but other brands like uh, Barrel Bourbon and uh, Catoctin Creek and people like that have opened up a little bit. And so you know, you're starting to get some, some really nice uh, barrel picks from places you wouldn't th- normally think of. And it is uh, a treasure trove if you know where to look. Yeah. And I, not only that, as you know, you're talking about that, we've even seen a lot of single barrel programs sort of die off. You know, a lot of them, as you mentioned, from Heaven Hill, some from Buffalo Trace. So it is becoming a a, a harder, harder, harder program to kind of get into. And, and here's what I'll say about that is that when you when you hear someone say they're no longer doing it, that just means they're no longer doing it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're still doing it for somebody because let me tell you something. Uh, there are some accounts folks aren't turning down. No one's turning down, you know, Bill Thomas, uh, you know, Jack Rose, or if they are turning him down, you know, they're, they're making up for it with something else. So it is, th- there are a lot of accounts that no one would dare turn down. And, uh, um, you know, Jack Rose Cannon, uh, just throwing a, a Vegas hotel out there like Bellagio, you know, these are just, these are accounts that no one's going to want to say no to. And we might have one of those accounts on the show here tonight. So that's a good segue to introduce our guest. So tonight we have Jamie Ferris. Jamie is the owner of the Lincoln Road Package Store in Heidisburg, Mississippi. So Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's it's always good to to have uh, a few different angles that we're going to talk about tonight. You know, first off with store picks, second with the retail side. But before we really dive into that, I kind of want to give folks an idea of who you are. How did you get into bourbon? How did you get into owning a, a liquor store as well? Well, so my brother actually opened uh, the first liquor store in a dry county in Mississippi, in Hattiesburg, uh, back in 1994. So that's kind of how I've been involved with the liquor business for that long. And then an opportunity came up to open one of my own here in an area of town that was doing some expansion. And so that's where we kind of took advantage of it. And we started expanding into wine and really had a tremendous wine selection. Well, our wine customers started asking for some higher end scotches and more and better scotches. And it kind of bled into scotch and then on into bourbon. And then we started just having the trouble of getting, as we were talking about earlier, the allocated whiskeys, it was starting to get where we couldn't get enough of them to, you know, make our customers happy. You get three bottles of this or sits of this and you got 12, you're trying to make happy. And then that's when we discovered and started doing the, single barrel private barrel pick programs now take me back to dry county mississippi were you like going to uh, moonshine shacks and uh getting jars of the good stuff made in the hills or what was that like no it just meant you couldn't you know at that time i was you know 14 just doing the stock for him and so it just meant that you just couldn't go buy beer or whiskey uh, or vodka or anything in those dry counties until the city expanded its city limits and it became wet. Well, you're still surrounded by, we have three uh, counties that are dry surrounding where we are right now. A lot of customers from there, I bet. Absolutely. Yeah, they got, they got to travel in to get it. I, it kind of reminds me back in the days of college when Lexington uh, couldn't sell beer or anything on on Sundays, and so we'd have to drive all the way to Louisville to just buy our beer if we had uh, no school on Monday or something like that. We could have a, an excuse for a party night. So no. I'm, sure you, I'm sure you get that every day, though. Yeah, we couldn't buy cold beer in Startville when I was there, so we'd have to drive about 20 minutes to buy cold beer. Mm. So we talked about that a little bit before we started, Sue, because you're a, you're a Mississippi State guy. That's right. Which is cool because we're all – at least – at least two of the people here are, are SEC fans. Uh, Fred's Fred's the outlier here. Yeah, I mean Oklahoma State. You know, we'll go Pokes. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if you need uh, if you need a defense to run over, uh, where are your people? So, <laughs> so I I want to give people an idea as well as the store. You know, you, we talked about store picks. However, I think you need to explain the the gravity of of what it is because. If anybody that hasn't 
known about Lincoln Road before, you can actually go and check out their Facebook page. And every once in a while, uh, Jamie or his wife will actually post. They say, here's the store picks that we have available. And it's, I, I think, like, you're into, like, the 40s of, of different things that you have available. Maybe even more. Yeah, I don't even know how many we have right now. We started getting into more with rums and brandy and even tequila. Um, we, we've got some tequila barrels we've done recently um, that'll be coming in that we're excited about. Um, and so it's just starting to branch out completely with everything and looking at trying to make it where this is the only place you can get that product. You come in and you like that burnt bottle. It's a single barrel product that you can only get here. And that's really kind of creates, you know, a following of customers and makes them decide that, Hey, we're going to the beach from Arkansas. We're going to take a detour and go by Lincoln road on our way down and grab some bottles of bourbon on the way or tequila or brandy. So a question that I'm gonna have for you is, how do you get your hands on all this? Because I know a few liquor stores here in town and their reps will come to them and say like, yeah, you can get maybe like maybe one barrel a year. And then I've known other people out in California and they're like, I think there's only two barrels that are allocated for the entire state, except you've got, I mean, tons, tons of this stuff. So who's, whose palms are you greasing to make this happen? <laughs> Luckily, we were one of the first ones in line buying barrels. Like as I always joke and say, we were buying barrels when buying barrels wasn't cool. So now that it's the thing to do, everybody's trying to buy barrels and trying to copy what other stores are doing, which I don't blame them, but Luckily, some have held their loyalty to us. Some distilleries have. Some have cut us back. You know. So who's, um, who's cut you back? Uh, it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily the distilleries. It's more or less the reps wanting to. They call it spread it around. Um, you know, we've been cut back a little bit from uh, from Buffalo Trace. Uh, we don't get as many as we used to, um, but that is what it is. I mean, Four Roses has cut us back a little bit, but I say a little bit. It's just it's not much. We used to go in there and can buy sits at one time. You know, if we tried, you know, 12 or 14 barrels and we liked, you know, five or six of them, we'd buy them. But now that's changed. You know, it's one per. Now, does that, I mean, does that piss you off a little bit? Because you kind of brought a lot of these people to the dance and now they're telling you, you know, that, you know, hey, thanks, but we got this other guy over here we want to take care of. <laughs> you got to remember, I'm in Mississippi, so we're not the biggest market. So I'm just happy with what I can get. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when we're buying, you know, like he's talking about two barrels for the whole state of California and we may buy four or something like that for the year. So we're getting double their allocation when we're in a market of, I don't know, say three million people in the whole state where you got cities out there that have three times, four times that population. So we're not the biggest, you know, state on the, so when you, the market. When you, when you say reps, you're not you're not competing. it. You're not dealing with someone in um, in Mississippi. You're talking about the. No, I'm talking about the, Missis rep. the Mississippi allocation. Okay. So the Mississippi allocation, they'll come in and just divide that up amongst their top Sazerac accounts. And so I guess another question to kind of tail off on that is, has has the allocation just for Mississippi decreased? And then that means that you're getting decreased? Or has it kind of stayed the same and then you have you kind of have to share the pie with more people now? I think it's probably increased to be honest. And I just have to share the power with more people. Um, you know, we have some stores across the country that'll call distilleries and complain about us. Why are they getting so many barrels? Why are they doing this? Why are they allowed to do that? And it just is, it's frustrating for us because they're calling and complaining, but it also should be, you know, a compliment, I guess that, that we're doing something right, that people are noticing us. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a crybaby move, wouldn't you think, that you're going to go and tattle on the rep because somebody's got an extra barrel that you didn't? I guess so. Yeah, you're right. But <laughs> it gets nitpicking, as y'all see. Y'all y'all see the bourbon world we're in right now. And Fred brought up a good point, too, about you know bringing these people to the dance. So give people an idea of when did you actually start getting into the, the private barrel game? Uh, before anybody else. So like what year was that? that probably that you can remember about 10 years ago. So we're probably, uh, we started picking Elijah Craig barrels. I'm um, actually, our first barrel was a Jack Daniels single barrel. We did for, right before, right after hurricane Katrina. And we did a portion of the proceeds went to a Katrina fund back in 2005, but we didn't buy another barrel until probably 2008, 2009. And we started buying Elijah Craig barrels at that time from heaven Hill. And 
you know, bring them in. And then we were like, wow, we sold through that in two months. That's pretty good. You know, 20 at that time, it was $22 a bottle, 19 22 And so nothing for a 12 year old single barrel, as Fred was saying earlier. I mean, it's an easy sell here. I got a 12 year old single barrel. I picked it's fantastic. I think you should buy it. And people were buying it. And and then we bought it, trickled into like um, Henry McKenna, uh, a lot, uh, Eagle Rare single barrel was one that we did. And um, like, I think we were the first one in Mississippi to do a Eagle Rare, Buffalo Trace and Weller uh, barrels from, from uh, Buffalo Trace. But then it's kind of been, we've been cut since then. Eh, 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 eh. Yep. But luckily, Eddie Russell, uh, Four Roses, Knob Creek, um, those guys aren't cutting us. We're still allowed to kind of do about the same, you know, on some level. Uh, like I said, not Four Roses. We can't go in and buy sips to eight at a time, but we're still able to pick up a decent number of barrels compared to other people in the state, luckily. And so you've been around the, the barrel game for quite some time. So over – over the course, you've seen them change. You've seen ones that have come online, like the Makers 46 program. Uh, you've seen things that have died off that have come, that we kind of talked about earlier, from Buffalo Trace or Heaven Hill. What do you kind of think is I'll, – I'll put this in two parts, and I'll ask the first one. Uh, what program right now do you think does the best job for single barrels and gives you that that great experience? I knew you were going to ask me that question. Um, so – they're they're all different. Let me say that. So I took a group up a couple of weeks ago to pick barrels and I showed them they got to go to um, two different distilleries and pick one with Eddie Russell and one at 1792. So they can see the difference of the mm-hmm. two. Not that one was better than the other. It's pretty cool being in the Rick house with Eddie Russell and going around and trying different barrels. And, you know, you get one glass and then if you decide you want to try on blind side by side at the end, you got to go back and say, all right, this one, this one, and everybody's sharing the glass. Um, at Four Roses, it's cool because you get to sit there and try different recipes side by side. Um, now, Josh is a listener of the show, so don't you badmouth them right now. I'm not badmouthing Josh. We did a <laughs> pretty cool thing with, uh, with Josh Hollifield, everybody from yeah. 1792, for those who are unaware. Yeah, no, Josh is great. We got to uh, go into there on Friday, that Friday and, uh, we ended up blending a couple 1792 foolproof barrels together and they came out, they came out pretty fantastic. So we're excited about that. Um, so he, he kind of came up with that idea a little bit with us as we were trying to blend, but we didn't take too long doing that, but that's something that's just cool that you can, you can do because you can't just go into Russell's reserve and say, I'm going to blend two barrels together. I don't think they're equipped for that. They could do, but um, I know where 1792 does that small batch now blend. So, I can easily see how those someone could sit there for eight hours and try to figure out which ones they want to blend together, trying all this stuff. But to answer your question on which one's the best program right now, I don't think there is just one that's the best. I think that they're all different and you're just able to see when you go up there to try what it is for taste Knob Creek barrel proof. And that's going to be proof down to a hundred. All right. You, so, so I, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, no, no, you're, 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 you're playing being, the politics game. Yeah, you're the playing the politics game. You're, you're playing the, the role, right? Uh, of, of making sure you don't piss anyone off. But we, we <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to get cut, Fred. I'm trying not to get, yeah, I understand. Cut. But, and I, I am very, I, I appreciate that. I'm sensitive to that. But we both know that it's different now than it was five years ago. Oh, absolutely. Five years ago, it's, I imagine you were probably rejecting barrels. Now you're just, you know, are you just, are you, do you, do you approach this the same that you did, you know, as you did five years ago, or are you a little bit more accepting? Uh, yes, we still look like, so when I'm tasting barrels, so when people ask me, they say, Russell Reserve, what are you going and looking for at Russell Reserve? You picked a lot of barrels at Russell Reserve, and I always tell them, when you find it, you'll know. And that's kind of how I feel about it. So when I'm going in and I'm tasting, I'm looking for a bigger mouthfeel, some of that complexity that you talked about earlier. And I'm a big finish guy. So I want it to hang out and be nice on the back end and still chew and taste on it in a good way. Not that I'm just burning alcohol on my 
on my chest and um, tongue there. So, but that's kind of what I look for. And I mean, now sometimes you're taking the best of what's there. So yeah, you could be acceptable more on some, but I don't really think there may have been a couple that we've just accepted, but not many in my opinion, because I would hate to put my name on something that's just not, it's not, not good. How often have you rejected, uh, you know, barrel samples? Uh, I've done it twice on the barrel samples. I usually go to the distillery cause I want them to know that I'm making a commitment to drive nine hours to come see you. So mm-hmm. I'm putting this time and effort in. So at least you can do is roll out good barrels for me. So like when they do roll them out and then you, you taste through the, through the ones that they roll, um, you taste through the, to, to that, what they, what they rolled out. Do you ever say, I don't like these. Give me something else. Let's go in the warehouse. Let's find the, the sweet spot that I'm looking for. I mean, how do you approach it when you don't get what you like? I always ask if they have any, any other ones laying around. <laughs> it's kind of the way yeah, it's like this. It's it's basically what people walk into the store and ask you like, Hey Jimmy, right. you, got, you got any bottles in the back? Well, no, it's a, I got a funny call the day. They called and said, Hey, do you have any Pappy laying around? And I was like, no, I don't have any just laying around. So now I approached it that way. I go in and kind of say, you know, with Eddie, you just keep trying. Um, Four roses. There's usually, you know, six, seven, depending on how many recipes they've got out there that you're trying through. And usually to me, there's at least definitely a good one in that bunch. Sometimes I've heard people say that they have been there and they haven't had a good one in that bunch. Um, Knob Creek usually has a few extras laying around if you're, you know, buying enough. Um, like we have, I mean, we bought five of those this past year, uh, from Knob Creek. Um, so I feel like they're there. You just have to kind of look for them, I guess. You're really throwing a wrench in the, the Knob Creek uh, process because the way that they work is they've got three barrels. They're laid out red, green, blue, and then you've got tasting glasses that are actually etched red, green, blue. And you're telling them to bring out more barrels. And they're like, we, we've got no more, We've got no more colors left. Like you're, you're screwing with us here, Jamie. Well, you're, we're usually going in saying we're going to buy a couple, a couple barrels. So we get to try three to six, you know, so we're trying a few more cause we're usually buying more. See, that's the smart move right there. You got to come in and just start, start bringing in like uh, envelopes full of cash and saying, don't worry, we're, we're not here. We're here, not here to mess around. That's the play. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There was one thing that you had kind of talked about with the 1792 and you're saying that you're starting to do blending. Now, I, this isn't the first time I've, I've heard of uh, a store going this way because they have, they have the opportunity, as you mentioned yourself, and you have uh, a choice of some good barrels in front of you. However, you always want to sit there and think, what if? Uh, what if we blended these two together? Are, are you looking at blending because our single barrels getting boring or is it because it's just something unique that, Hey, I can buy multiple barrels now and I can just put them together. Well, we took our allocation instead of going a couple times a year. Let me backtrack a little bit on one thing that we talked about briefly. And then I'll answer your question. What is getting harder to do is it's getting harder to get into the distilleries to pick a barrel. So like when I scheduled my 1792 pick and the Russell Zerb pick I did at the end of September, I scheduled those in March, beginning of March, or that would never have happened to us. That, that hadn't happened to us in the past. When I called Eddie or would, you know, try to schedule with Eddie, it was like, Hey, I'm gonna be up there in four weeks. Do you have any time to meet? We can pick a barrel. He'd be like, sure, come on up. Not anymore. It's just completely changed with that. I think Knob Creek Rye has pushed their program further back where you got to start planning six to seven months ahead of time. The same with four roses. Um, you got to really start planning ahead on your trips. It's, it's not this last minute stuff anymore like we used to could do. And so that's changed. So when I got my allocation for 1792, I had to book it in September. Well, I had three barrels to pick. So we ended up taking one that was a bottled and bond. And then we decided with these two full proofs that they were fantastic blended together. It was just a dumb luck, I would say. You know, one of the guys said, Hey, have you ever thought about blending these? And I said, No, I haven't. And I knew when we did a small batch, you got to blend two barrels together to do a 1792 small batch now. So that's not something that I've ever been, you know, 
big part of doing. I know Ditson obviously considered a master blender. I know Ed Bly has done a lot of blending lately with, with some of the stuff he's done. I know, um, I guess I always butchered up Julio's in uh, Massachusetts has done some blending with some of their barrel picks, but this is the first time we've done it. It's not something that we're all of a sudden trying to go down that road to do, because like I said earlier, I would be sitting there the way I am trying to make it perfect and sit there for, you know, five or six hours instead of, you know, an hour and a half. You know, Kenny, we're kind of getting back to a spot in the 1950s and 60s where these stores were actually getting their own private labels. Like they would do these picks like this, but then it would it, it would evolve into their own label. And we've seen that with uh, Delilah's. Uh, Jack Rose has been working on something similar. You know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, Liquor Barn has their own their own uh, private label and Flatboat. Uh, Kroger Costco. has their own Costco. I mean, there's a lot of private labels, but you saw it in the 50s and 60s with these smaller guys, too. And Jamie, I'm curious, you know, the next step is for you to have your own label. Are you looking into something like that? We've talked about it. We haven't really tackled it. Um head on yet it's just been a conversation but it hasn't been anything that we've found the right partner with i guess so what you're saying is you you've been getting no on that <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah right. it's, it doesn't sound like you're having a problem getting the barrels maybe it's having a problem saying can i have these barrels but not under your your label name that's right. That's right. And I know with Bardstown um, Bourbon Company coming on board, there's opportunity there to do to do it. But, um, you know, that's a big chunk of change you got to put out there. How much? I think you got to I think it's around a thousand. You got to commit to anywhere from a thousand to two thousand barrels. And how much is that like per barrel? <laughs> uh, you're probably looking around nine to nine hundred to a thousand a new make. So it's a little bit of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, sure is. A couple million dollars. I'm, I'm guessing the uh, Mississippi State Bank isn't going to be lending you for, you know, to help you out there with those barrels. <laughs> no, they won't give us loan on our inventory. <laughs> really? Because, no, because they don't have a um, liquor permit. So, yeah, the challenge of being in Mississippi. <laughs> Speaking of Mississippi, and we were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier, and you had mentioned that people will go on a road trip and they'll stop by and, and they'll be like, okay, I got to, I got to hit Lincoln road. I got to go 30 minutes out of the way just to go and check out this store. Now, do you think that you've kind of put Heidi'sburg on the map a little bit because of with bourbon in general? I wouldn't say like the town, like in general, because we've had a lot of good things here with Southern Miss. Um, obviously I would say Brett Favre may have put us on the map. But maybe in the bourbon world, we have done that, but not in the whole scheme of everything uh, overall. So what, how far away is like the nearest major city? Not to, uh, not to shit on and say Heidi, Heidisburg's not a major city. No, but. we're not. Uh, New Orleans is uh, 86 miles. So, I mean, it, for, my, for my opinion, I mean, I think it's, it's very impressive because you think about it and you're like, you're not Atlanta, you're not Louisville or Lexington that, that are kind of just, I, not to say Louisville and Lexington are major, but in major in regards of bourbon. And so you've kind of found this ability to be able to say, I can have this, this store pick paradise in the middle of Mississippi that maybe that people, it's it's kind of like this, like you said. It's a, Fred kind of ventured to it earlier. It's just a little this kind of little hidden gem now. That's right. We've been fortunate with where we are that we're about an hour and a half between a lot of little bit bigger cities than us. Um, you know, we're not far from Mobile. Birmingham's like three three hours, which that's a trek. But we have a lot of people coming from there, going to New Orleans. Um, you know. We've got Nashville, the people coming south from there. I know that says Nashville, that's five hours away. But still, we have where people are traveling a lot more more these days. So it is nice to have become a destination shop, as I call it. Huh. So there's one question that kind of that came in from Dave, who's our, our good friend at Rare Bird 101. And he said some of the Lincoln Road picks are credited to Misty. Explain right. exactly who Misty is. 
So Misty's my wife. Um, she enjoys drinking wine. So she's a wine drinker, but she has a fantastic palate and knows what she likes when it comes to bourbon. And she's looking for specific things and s specific points that it hits on her palate and her, you know, mid mid palate that she looks for. And when you when she does, she knows it and she says this is the one. Nice. So we've got so, the Misty pick. You've got you've got a pick that you've done with Dixon. Are you are you looking to kind of take this and say I think that there's a market for more of these like collaboration picks rather than Absolutely. just something I do myself? Absolutely. Absolutely. I 100% I think there's a market for collaboration picks. Um you know with me and her doing it I get a lot of questions all the time. Well, which one's Misty's favorite? You know, you talked about earlier we have 40 or 50 different uh, barrel picks in the store and a lot of times she hasn't had it. like she wasn't with me on that pick, so she hasn't had it. So uh, most of the time that she's with us, um, her name is on it, so people know that she was involved with it. Because hmm. she does have a better palate than I do. Women do have, uh, in my opinion, have fantastic palates. They have most of them have better palate than men. I'd agree with that. In fact, there's been some there's been some joking uh, in some past barrel picks that. Uh, people would, you know, put their marriage on the quality of a barrel, you know, saying like, if it's not as good as I'd say it is when it's bottled, then, you know, I'll sign the divorce papers. So people, the husband, wife couples uh, tend to take these barrel picks very seriously when they do them together. I'm just glad uh, that she comes along with me and enjoys it and she can pick a fantastic barrel. Bourbon Pursuit wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreon community, and with help of our following partners. Stepping through those gates of whiskey prison, it's like taking a step back in time. Southern Grace Distilleries at Mount Pleasant Prison hasn't made any updates to the structure of the prison since it moved in in 2016. The flickering lights in the background, the faint sound of water dripping in the distance, a gush of steam, and the clanging of a wrought iron door. That's what the guys at Rackhouse Whiskey Club experienced when they visited to see what's being distilled inside. Beyond the impressive story, they found some really good whiskey. The next Rackhouse Whiskey Club box ships in April, so choosing what to feature was a difficult decision. But they're excited to be featuring the double gold medal award-winning Conviction Small Batch Bourbon. It's the first bourbon ever to legally be aged behind bars. And they also get a bottle of their Sun Dog Pink Lemonade, which was named the 2017 USA Spirited Lemonade of the Year. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ships out every two months to 40 states, and along with bottles, includes some cool merchandise. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and taste the freedom of whiskey prison. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. So let, let's take a look at like you, you're you're involved in a lot of other categories. You're you're obviously known for for bourbon, but is there another category that you see with the same kind of passion and um, fan base as bourbon right now? So, if you'd have asked me that probably about three or four months ago, I'd have been rum, and I still think rum is a tremendous category that's growing, and the possibilities of getting some of these. Um, distilleries in the Caribbean on board with single barrel program. Like we've been talking, you know, obviously Campari owns Russell's Reserve. So I talked with them about Appleton doing single barrel program, but they're, they're, they move slow. Um, you know, the big corporations like Pinot Ricard and um, Campari and those guys, they move a little bit slower than the rest because they're, they're not seeing that they're, they're worried about jumping through the hoops that they have to jump through. Um, but we've been seeing a lot of high-end tequila sales recently, which has been kind of interesting to us. Um, I mean, in the in the hundred, you know, in the over a hundred dollar range, you know, which is unusual. But you're seeing we're seeing a shortage on our end of like Don Julio 1942 was just thrown on allocation for us, so now it's on allocation because of the shortage of the agave plant. So that could be something that we see in the future coming is. Tequila shortage, possibly. <laughs> Tequila pursuit coming to an iTunes near you. That's right. And you know, hey, you never know. There could be tequila curious in the, <laughs> in the book form. So 
<laughs> we're going to come out from all angles, but that's right. We got to change the subject because I have I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to tequila. <laughs> that's okay. Well, we'll we'll take care of you, Kenny. Uh, so what I'm hearing is 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 vodka is not doing very well. Um, vodka is vodka. I mean, it's gonna Tito's is the elephant in the room right now. I mean, it is yeah. just by far and away. I mean, what they've been able to do is just impressive. I mean, it is just. I mean, we probably sell ten to one. Uh, Tito's to anything else right now um it's it's just like it just blows my mind at how well that they've been able to do with their basic packaging and you know everybody loves it it's good it's good vodka it's at twenty dollars I and mean, you can't beat it you're gonna well, have, your friend's gonna have a brain aneurysm if you keep yeah. going <laughs> yeah I was hoping he was about to diss vodka, so that's why I set him up, and then he compliments him. So, <laughs> well, uh, le- lesson learned there. It pays yeah. the bills, right? So that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let, let's go back to bourbon. Thank God. Yeah, <laughs> I want to talk specifically about Maker's Mark's uh, barrel selection program. Okay, I have I have tried to explain that thing to people, and they look at me like I'm from Mars. How do you? Because you've done some picks there. How, how have how have you explained that? Because it's such a cool experience, but it, it's so impossible to explain. Like even bourbon geeks, it, they have a hard time understanding it until they experience it. It is, and I had trouble understanding it until I experienced it, and it was a a fantastic experience um, to be able to sit there. It made me appreciate of what people do that are actually blending stuff together to make good whiskey. Um, so understanding that and trying to explain that to them is a kind of a, I don't know. So a way I explain it is saying, all right, you have makers 46. It's aged in these stays for six weeks to eight weeks. And then they have several other stays that have different flavor profiles, different taste profiles, different complexities, that they do the same with for those. And then we go through and taste those and blend those together to make the bourbon or whiskey that we're looking for, which obviously is bourbon. So what we did recently with ours was we took a bottle of our previous pick in and everybody was like, well, why don't you just do the same stage? It's going to be the same. And I was like, no, it's not going to be the same whiskey. And they're like, what do you mean? It's not going to be the same whiskey. And I said, well, because it's going to be from a different distillate date. It's different proof. I mean, this one was 107 when we uh, tried it cast strength which was a lower proof for them. And so we went off of what our basic one that was that we first did and then changed it a little bit to have that more big mouth fill and creamy finish that we wanted. So basically I kind of explain it as you got five different whiskeys in front of you and you're trying to blend them together to make it a better whiskey. I don't know if I explained that well or not, but it is a tricky explanation there by sticking staves in the barrel so yes yeah <laughs> it's the voltron of of whiskeys you gotta, oh ooh. i like that see like that. yeah you, you gotta bring them all together and figure out if it's the uh what is it the yellow line and the red line and blue line and make them all into one that's gonna be better than the sum of its parts i love that <laughs> for anybody that's like an 80s kid out there that used to love that and might get that one yeah <laughs> So I want to change it up a little bit and kind of talk about the retail side. And it, because, you know, you are a package store after all. We got to you got to you got to deal with the calls of Pappy that come in every single day. But I kind of want to get an idea of what does the average bourbon shopper really look for versus that's the the whiskey or bourbon aficionado. What are they looking for when they're coming to your store? Um a lot of times, of course, you know, now we're getting allocated on just the basic bourbons. Like with, of course, everybody comes in looking for Buffalo Trace products, um, no matter what. I mean, everybody wants either Buffalo Trace, Weller, um, any of those products, the Blantons, uh, all that stuff. That's the big elephant in the room. And like, you know, we have customers that travel from like Jackson to the coast, which are cities that are not far from us that come in and they'll... They'll come in all the time, and that's the only thing they ask for. We always ask them, like, what can I help you find? And, and a lot of people are not – they're closed-minded because they just think this is it. And so some of the regular customers know our experience that we've had and our knowledge, and so they'll listen to us and try different things. But some of the bourbon aficionados, they won't. Some of them are just closed – they're just closed off looking for this. 
Um, we try to push them to barrel picks. The problem with some of the barrel picks is majority of the barrel picks are over a hundred proof. Hmm. So that runs into a guy that's an everyday bourbon drinker. It's hard for him to swallow going into a hundred and ten proof Russell's Reserve or one twenty when you tell him that up front. But you say, hey, you could add your own ice or water to it to bring it down to whatever proof you enjoy drinking it at. But that still is the challenge that we run across is getting these guys onto some of the barrel picks because of the proof. Um, you know, you, you talk to some guys and you say, oh, Wild Turkey 101. And they're like, oh, no, I don't want that at all. They think they hear 101 proof. So when you go from 101 to 110, 115, 120, um, that's a challenge. But the the good thing is that we do have some of the bourbon f- aficionados that understand that and will come in and pick those up. But the everyday bourbon guys are still – we're still trying to bring them on along. And like I said before, we're in Mississippi, so we're trying to teach and trying to educate on our end. And one challenge that we have is I wish we could do more of is in-store tastings. Um, we can do one a, one a quarter, and that's it. So right. and they, is, that, is that a law? Yes. Oh, for fuck's sake. I know. I mean, so, you, so when you do have it, it's a fucking party. <laughs> somewhat. We try to, but it has to be opened that day. We have to file for the permit 30 days in advance. We have to send a report in after that. It's just a big challenge when if we could just say, hey, I'm not. I mean, look, I'm not in the business of getting people drunk and saying, hey, here, I'm going to give you a bunch of free booze. Let me get you drunk and you leave my store and drive drunk. That's not what I want to do. But if I have someone trying to decide which barrel pick they want to try or buy that day. And so, Hey, I have all these open already. Do you want to try any of these? I'll pour you a half ounce pour and you try them and then you decide, you know, and of course if the same guy keeps coming in every day trying to, Hey, I need to try a new barrel pick. You know, then we'll catch on to that. But you know, I could just imagine these Mississippi legislators debating this issue, you know, before the state, you know, like how the hell are they rationalizing you know, quarterly tasting. Oh, oh, look, a saw can only get one tasting per quarter. I just, that just, that stuff just pisses me off. That's an absolute travesty for what you're trying to do, Jamie. And you're trying to educate people. You're trying to, you know, teach people uh, how to taste good bourbon. And they're just hamstringing you. This is, that's just ridiculous. I agree. I agree. They don't, uh, try to explain to them that if we could let these people try this product, they might buy more, which means more tax dollars for the state, but they're worried about everybody leaving the store drunk. You know what they're actually worried about is what their mamas are going to think if they vote for it. (laughs) I I know know boys from Mississippi and that's all they care about is what their mamas think. So, you know, maybe the next generation, um, you know, you'll get it passed in 50 years. Yeah, I hope so. I don't think I'll be around by then, but now you sound like a young, young, young man. <laughs> Ooh. You got a few more years of retail underneath your underneath your hat, and you could still keep going. <laughs> so I, I kind of want to talk about that retail side just a little bit more because I see it here in Louisville all the time. Uh, you've got these, I call them, I call them vultures. They're, they're essentially they'll go to a store, they'll kind of look around. And then they'll just leave. Uh, They might talk to somebody. They might say, hey, is there anything? What you got anything new? Uh, Anything in the back? Whatever it is. How often do you get that? And then is it just annoying when people come in and they just kind of look around and leave? Yeah, it is. Usually I'll try to stop them before they go out the door and be like, was there not something you could find? Because we greet everybody that comes in the door. That's a big thing for us, customer service. Welcome so, to Moe's. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. How are you doing? Can I help you find anything? What are you looking for? And a lot of people say, no, I'm just looking. Uh, and then after they shop around for five or 10 minutes, I'll come up and I'll ask them myself again and say, is there something specific that you're looking for? And, um, you know, and then there comes, then they, then they come out with, well, I got this list here that my buddy sent me. And, you know, of course, it's all the Pappy, all the BTAC, the limited edition stuff, the birthday bourbon right now has been the hot one that we've had a lot of people asking about. Um, And so it's just as something that keeps keeps coming. And I finally I hate to say this, but I was not in the best of mood the other day. And I had a guy like you're saying, a vulture coming in. And every time he comes in, he's looking for one product, one product. And he and he finally said the other day and I said, well, 
every time you come in, that's all you ask for. And you don't buy anything else from us. And it finally, his eyes got big and he was like, well, and he kind of mumbled a little bit. And then he, you know, he bought some other stuff. And then I, and then I, of course, sold him a bottle that he was asking for. I said, I do have it for you, but you know, you ask for this every time. And so one of my guys looked at me and said, I'm surprised that you said something to him about that. And I said, well, at some point it just wears on you. You know, as a store owner, it just wears on you, the, the number of calls and stuff we have. And a lot of times my first question to when someone calls on the phone is, well, have you ever been in my store? And they'll be like, no, I haven't, but I was planning on coming down there. And I was like, oh, you're planning on coming down to pick up the bottle of Pappy 15 that you're asking me about. And yeah. and so, I, I mean, I reserve those bottles for my customers who help me pay the light bill. You know, yeah. the guys that shop with me on a weekly basis. And if I had any advice to people looking for those bottles. Buy still, a lot of Tito's vodka. No, not vodka. buy a lot of Tito's vodka. For vodka. God's sakes, but, Kenny. Come on, man. <laughs> but you have your store that you go to and build that relationship with that owner in that store. Stay with that store. Don't just go around to every store in town or every store and be like, hey, you got this, you got that. I mean, that's that's just the way I, I think. You know, because I have my regular customers that have been regular customers for years that I take care of. And I'm going to continue taking care of those guys. Yeah, it, it kind of seems it's the, the same story no matter where, where it is. You've got to you got to support the stores. You just can't walk in, ask for something and leave and expect one day that they're going to be like, oh, yeah, you've been so persistent. Here you go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's a little bit too, you know, Jamie, it's a little bit too kind of like the you know, the barrels that, you know, the, the situation you've been through, like you brought a lot of these distillers to the dance and now, they, you know, you're having to compete with, you know, Johnny Newcomer in California. And, um, you know, you've got a lot of customers been with you for a long time and it would be a disservice to them if you were to give that pappy 15 year old to the guy who's been supporting you for five, six years. That's right. You're, you know, you're exactly right on that. If I just gave it to this guy that came in and not the guy that's been there for five or six years. Do you, do you foresee an end in the craziness? <sighs> I, I hope so. I don't really see one because I see what our alloc like we're on allocation on a lot of products that I would think that are not that old. Uh, when I say not that old, that are six years old. And we're on allocation with those products. And like, I feel like this bourbon shortage and bourbon craze has been going on for a little bit longer than that. They, they've got to be catching up at some point, I hope, is the only thing that I can say. Um, because it's just getting more and more frustrating for me and for other store owners and for customers that, you know, we get some of them we get and we don't even put them out because I've got older customers that are, you know, late 60s, 70s that have been drinking this stuff for seven, eight, nine, ten years. And now I'm mm -hmm. going to say, oh, you can't get your favorite whiskey anymore. I'm sorry. Even though you've been buying it here for 10 years. No, I'm going to set that in the back for those guys that have been buying it for 10 years because they were the ones that were buying it before anybody else was buying it. Yeah. And they get upset with me if I don't have it for them. <laughs> <laughs> How often does that happen? I try not to let it happen, but it does happen probably, you know, once every six weeks or so. I mean, are you just like, I, I swear it's not, it's not on me. I'm, I'm waiting for the case to come in. That's exactly right. I've got it on order. It's on order. I promise you. <laughs> so I'll kind of tail off with one last question on that. And is there any sort of new trends that you're seeing with inside of the, the whiskey market from the retail side? Um, whether it's, uh, newer labels, sourced whiskey, um, craft whiskey. I don't know. Like, what do you see as like the new trend? That hold on, hold on, Jamie. Doesn't it sound like when he says craft whiskey, he's saying crap whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? I swear, every time he says craft whiskey, I feel like he's saying crap whiskey. It, it, it was borderline there. I thought I heard. I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Kenny. I need to. I need to clear the saliva out of my uh, out of my mouth then. <laughs> Crapped, crap. Uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go. That was rude. No, I'll, well, I'll start pr pronouncing those T's a little bit more. I guess. Uh, um, I feel like the craft trend has kind of come and gone a little bit, in my opinion, from what we're seeing here. 
I'm seeing more sourced whiskey trend coming in. Um, you know, obviously with, with barrel bourbon, and I think those guys are doing a good job with what they're doing. And, and, you know, from talking to Joe, I mean, they don't have like contracts with people. They're just able to go find it and buying other people's stuff from, from other people that have bought it. Like, so like, for instance, they may be able to buy some, let's just use heaven Hill stuff that they're buying from a third party that already had bought it from heaven Hill, but they're buying it from them at a, you know, to profit from, for those that third party that bought it from heaven Hill or, or whoever it was. So I think that those guys are able to doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, and then you've seen some new ones come on. I mean, like, obviously I think the first ones to the table were, was, uh, will it with the source whiskey and then, and I may be skipping some Fred will know more on this, but like smooth ambler was the other one that came to the table with a bunch of good barrels from MGP. And then you had bell mead was a trend there for a while. And then now you're seeing, um, I always butchered as a uh, blonde brothers, I think doing some whiskey picks now that have been really hot lately. Um, I'm seeing some, we don't have those in Mississippi. Um, unfortunately, cause we're that small market, but, uh, I'm seeing the trend there with those guys. Um, so in my store, we're seeing more of the source whiskey trend on the barrel bourbon side, but mm. I feel like the craft whiskey sales have really, really dropped off for us, which, you know, kind of goes hand in hand with what, what y'all said earlier, Fred said earlier. You kind of just brought up another thing that it's always kind of a hot button that I, I like to bring up and it, maybe you can kind of give your take on it a little bit too, is that you have a lot of these craft distillers that are starting with a sourced MGP product and then they want to bring their own product online. However, it seems that there's this imbalance, if you will. And so when they run out of the MGP product and then they can only say it's a nine or 10 or 11 year old whiskey, and then they got to put out their three, four or five year old whiskey. It sort of doesn't meet the expectations that some of the consumer market is starting to see. So what do you, what's your kind of feeling on that of, of people that are starting with MGP and then trying to either blend in their own product or just do a, a cold cut and then, start selling their own product. I think that's a tough thing for those guys. If in my opinion, I would prefer like is for them to realize that their whiskey's not old enough yet to be sold on its own and still go out there because undoubtedly there's still MGP products out there that you can go buy. Now, granted the price may be higher than what it was when you were buying it before, just charge more. I mean, in my, I, mean, I know some people are like, well, I like to be under the hundred dollar price point. Well, as y'all see on the secondary, I mean, people are buying stuff left and right for crazy amounts of money that, that that's OK. You know, they're spending two fifty, three hundred dollars on bottles that are just OK. You know, they're not great. They're buying them because of a name or whatever it is. But in my opinion, I think that they should continue trying to buy that source whiskey until their whiskey is of age to sell on its own. I mean, or. Or make gin or make vodka to pay your bills or rum, pay your bills until you can get by when your whiskey's of age, um, in, in my opinion. That's what I would do because I would just not want to put out a young product that tastes grainy and craft and is just, I don't know, like you get into some of these products and you can taste the youth in them. I mean, y'all know that. Y'all have had enough of them, I would think, you know, where y'all can, y'all try them and see and, you know, it's just not there yet. Yeah. All right. So, you, sorry, Fred, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you know, it puts, you always root, I root for these people personally. And I recently wrote a story for Forbes and it was, uh, the headline was something like craft whiskeys at disappoint or something like that. And it really caused a firestorm with a lot of people who make the whiskey because like, you know, we're different, we're doing things this way and that way. And it, 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 it's hard for for you, Jamie, because you're you're looking at it from like, what does the consumer want? And you probably want to support that little guy, but you know, at the end of the day, you got to pay the light bill, like you said. So, do you feel like it is uh, not a viable business option for you to be pushing craft whiskey? It comes down to a point of saying why is this whiskey at three years old, a hundred dollars or $125 a bottle or whatever it is. And then you can go and get 
something like Elijah Craig or Henry McKenna that's 10 to, you know, 11 to 12 years old or whatever the blend is in it nowadays at $30 a bottle. So I think that really is the challenge of me trying to recommend and them saying, Hey, well, what do you think of this $80 bottle? And I'm like, eh, like it's a four year old whiskey compared to something that's 10, you know, that's the challenge that I run across in my opinion. Um, Cause I know, with some products um, that we've been doing barrel picks of lately, um, there's been some that we're getting that are six to seven months younger than they were. And that is, in my opinion, is making a difference. And I, I, you know, it's just six or seven months, but on some of it, you can taste the difference in that, that time. It, it seems like that additional six, seven months, eight months in the barrel gets them another season or two. And those would it, it just smooths it out a little bit more. Um, so when you're talking about a three year old whiskey compared to a ten year old whiskey, it's just night and day. Yeah, I mean. Oh, one last thing I want to bring up because because you said the word not I, but you had said secondary, and it's always fun to talk about <laughs> retail side and secondary. So I kind of want to get your opinion on your thought of stores that basically get all these allocations, maybe not all these allocations, maybe they get a few bottles, but the bottles they do get in, they, they, everybody pays attention to the market and they price it a little bit above the market because they think somebody's going to pay it. So I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. My thoughts on it are that my bottles that I get that are allocated, that'll go at those crazy prices will go to my regular customers who are supporting me. And it's a reward for those guys to be able to come in and pay retail on those products is kind of the, how, the way I look at it, you know, thank you for shopping with me and spending this much throughout the year. You spent, you know, $10,000 a year with me on all these wines and these different scotches and bourbons that you're buying. And so here you go. I have this bottle for you. It's kind of how I do it. I don't, Sometimes I don't even know. I just call them and say, hey, are you interested in buying this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, oh, yes, I would love to get that. You know, thank you so much. Now, do you look at the secondary market as a as a healthy thing as well? Because you know what something's valued at. And maybe they don't like what's your what's your take on it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a, it's always healthy to have an open market, especially when you have a, I mean, it's just supply and demand. It's simple economics 101. So that's going to drive, you know, there's not enough supply. So the demand's going to come up and the price is going to come up higher. But on my end, if it's something that I can reward someone and make them more loyal to me is how I look at it. But I think the secondary is a, I can't say it's a good or bad thing. I think it's, you know, it drives the prices of some stuff just astronomical. I mean, where you go into places and you see a bottle and you're like, oh, they got a bottle of Van Winkle. And you're like, oh, shit, it's $750 for a 10-year-old. You know, mm -hmm. and no wonder that's still sitting there on the shelf. But you don't ever think to yourself, like, oh, I could have just sold these just a little bit higher and I could have had an extra mortgage payment taken care of. No, I try not to think of it that way because, uh, I, like I said, I try to – we don't get enough of it anyway to where it's like – I mean, when I'm saying I get maybe three to – you know, you get three to six bottles of some of these allocated products coming out now especially. I mean, some of them have even gone to three-bottle cases. So you're – I mean, you're not getting a ton of it. And I'd rather make a customer happy that spent – you know, I'll make the money up on the back end because yeah. they're going to be loyal to me. Absolutely. All right. So with that, I think we should probably start uh, wrapping this up. So Jamie, I want to say thank you again for, for coming on the show tonight. Give everybody a plug of where they can learn more about Package Road or sorry, Lincoln Road uh, Package Store, where they can find your store as well as social media and stuff like that. Yeah. So we have our um, Facebook page. You can search Lincoln Road Package Store. Uh, we also have a website. It's uh, LincolnRoadPackageStore.com. You can look at it now. It's not always completely up to date with our barrel pits because I'm the guy that has to do all that. Um, but the best thing to do is just go to our Facebook page. And if you have any questions on anything, you can also private message us and we'll answer those questions as fast as we can. Is it actually located on a road called Lincoln Road? That's right. Lincoln Road and 28th Avenue. We're on the corner of Lincoln and 28th. 
All right, so there wasn't a whole lot of thought going into the brand. It was pretty easy. Then. Hey, come on was, now. Hey, <laughs> I mean, I, absolutely. It was, hey, location-based. So people were like, where's Lincoln Road Package Store? We're on Lincoln Road. There you go. <laughs> Boy, you know, between the two of us, you're not going to have, uh, you know, not much self-esteem after all this <laughs> said and done, Jamie. <laughs> I just uh, appreciate y'all having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it was, it was great. Uh, and thank you for, for taking us through a lot of those different, I mean, we went, we, we ran the game with you tonight. We talked about secondary, talk about craft whiskey. We talked about retail stores. We talked about barrel picks. I, 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 we're going to probably have to set up a second episode here at some point to, to go even more with you. Maybe we do a barrel pick together. How about Uh-oh. that? Oh, I like, oh, I like oh. collaborations. Yeah, absolutely. Especially there we go. If, especially if Jamie's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, Jamie, thank you again for joining us. Make sure you follow him on social media as well as follow us, Burn Pursuit, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also, you can follow Fred Minnick at Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, sorry, follow Fred Minnick on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Also, subscribe to Bourbon Plus if you haven't yet. It's a great magazine. Everybody's going to enjoy it. And if you do like the show, you want to support us, we had I think almost 15 viewers on at some point tonight, and they got to see it live as it was happening. Support the show on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And that's how you get to ask all these fun questions to our guests. Uh, and we don't have to sit here and think of every single one. So we appreciate all of our Patreon supporters being able to do that as well. And if you have any more show suggestions, things you'd like to see, uh, questions for Fred or I or Ryan who couldn't be here tonight, send us an email, team at bourbonpursuit.com. With that, I want to say, Jamie, Fred, thanks again for everybody joining in tonight. It was a pleasure, and we'll talk to everybody next week. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.